I'm Jacob Heilbrunn, the editor of The National Interest, and my guest today for our podcast in The National Interest is Paul Saunders, the president of the Center for The National Interest. Paul is an expert on Russia, and we wanted to discuss the ghastly terrorist attack that took place yesterday in Moscow and has claimed over 100 lives. The United States had earlier this month warned Moscow that a terrorist attack might be imminent. In a speech this past Tuesday, however, Russian President Vladimir Putin blasted the American warnings, saying that they were provocative and that, quote, these actions resemble outright blackmail and the intention to intimidate and destabilize our society, end quote. In effect, Putin confirmed that the United States was issuing warnings. Paul, what does this imply for Vladimir Putin now that the elections have recently taken place in Russia, endowing him with a new term as president, yet a week later he's faced with what looks like an extremely embarrassing lapse in national security in Russia? Jacob, thank you. It certainly looks like a massive uh, intelligence failure uh, on the part of the Russian government and the Russian security services, starting with clearly a failure to take seriously the warnings that they received from the United States, which, you know, of course, occurred in the context actually of of other attempted uh, ISIS attacks in Russia. Uh, and, And the Russian security services actually had kind of prevented some other attacks from occurring. So it, it looks very bad for Putin. And I think we're we're seeing kind of very quickly uh, an effort here to uh, sort of seize the narrative and, and to, to try to explain what occurred uh, in a way that doesn't re- reflect quite as badly uh, on Mr. Putin and his leadership. The Russian authorities are now saying that some of these figures that were involved in this attack were attempting to flee to Ukraine, which the Ukrainian authorities are stoutly denying, and which it looks like an attempt by Russia to drag Ukraine into this as well. What is your interpretation of that? Well, look, I mean, first of all, the the Russian government says that it's arrested uh, the four people who were responsible for the attack and the attack and a total of 11 who were involved in uh, facilitating this uh, and and that they were attempting to flee to Ukraine. So I I guess the first question we have to ask ourselves is uh, whether that's actually a true statement. And did did they arrest all the perpetrators or or, are they trying to create the impression that they rolled this all up uh, very quickly? And, And I don't think we can really know the answer to that question at this point. Secondly, uh, look, I mean, if you commit a terrorist attack uh, in Moscow and you want to get out of Russia, the, the borders to the West are probably the easiest borders to reach. So uh, there would be a certain logic in trying to flee in that direction. It's a chaotic region. There's a war uh, underway. It, it wouldn't be uh, unreasonable uh, for anyone with plans like that to think about that as a way to slip out of Russia, because that, that's a way that you can get out without going through a border checkpoint or airport uh, security or uh, other uh, systems, you know, that, that might catch you. Now, the question that the Russians have raised, and President Putin said him said this himself directly in a, a statement today, actually, to the Russian people, he, he's been implying that this was somehow pre-arranged uh, with the Ukrainian government or, or that there was some cross-border uh, uh, coordination. Uh, it, you know, who knows? But it certainly looks like an effort uh, to deflect blame as part of a wider uh, systematic effort uh, to deflect blame that, you know, one of the at least one of the uh, alleged perpetrators uh, has already been uh, interviewed actually by Russian government television, sort of spilling his story, uh, which, uh, it, you know, I, I think would would not be the normal procedure for most criminal and terrorist investigations around the world. So we kind of have to ask ourselves uh, why uh, that occurred in that way. 
and, and that individual was uh, uh, actually claiming to have been recruited online and offered money, uh, actually, uh, to conduct uh, these attacks. Is Russia experiencing what other Western countries have experienced? Blowback from we know I, I, that these ISIS that ISIS is inv- is active in Afghanistan that these were allegedly members of a cell in Afghanistan has Russian activity in Syria now prompted this kind of blowback inside Russia itself. Look, I mean, that, that's that's been underway for a period of some years already. So it, it would not really be kind of a new event, actually, to have uh, ISIS or uh, other terrorists uh, kind of angry at Moscow uh, because of Russia's role in Afghanistan, Russia's role in Syria, uh, Russia's uh, long war in Chechnya. There are a variety uh, of different reasons for this. So, uh, yes, uh, certainly it does look like blowback and and very severe uh, blowback in this case. In December 1934, Leningrad party boss Sergei Kirov was assassinated at the Smolny Institute. That event was either planned by Stalin or at a minimum seized upon him. It triggered the beginning of the Great Purges. Do you believe, as some are speculating, that Putin will seize on this event? to usher in a wider crackdown or even martial law in Russia? Uh, Well, you know, first of all, just to be clear, uh, you know, one can never rule out anything in Russia, but I I think it's fairly unlikely uh, that that the Russian government itself was behind this. It's pretty hard to keep secrets like that uh, in the modern age, uh, even in Russia. And uh, I think that's uh, a little bit of a reach, but who knows? Uh, more generally, however, uh, will Putin seize on this? I, I expect he, he absolutely uh, will seize on this. And uh, it, it certainly provides uh, a, an opportunity to take uh, a hard look at uh, a variety of, you know, Russia's domestic security uh, agencies. And if there's anybody there uh, that he wants to get rid of, uh, that this is certainly this big opportunity. But, you know, I'd look more in the direction, perhaps, of uh, a new round of mobilization uh, of soldiers to to go fight in Ukraine. That's going to be politically uh, difficult for for Moscow at any time. Uh, It's not popular. Many people uh, support uh, war in general, but many fewer people are, are interested in fighting in them. Uh, And and I think we see that uh, in Russia in the same way that we do uh, in other countries. So I certainly uh, wouldn't be surprised at all if uh, this event and this uh, kind of alleged uh, Ukrainian role in it uh, also uh, is used to justify a variety of actions in that direction. So you do not see any sign that Putin's rule is being destabilized. On the contrary, He will use this to fortify it. Look, I think he'll try to use it to fortify it. I I, I, I think he's in control of of Russia's domestic media, uh, and that's allowing him uh, to try to define uh, what occurred here uh, in ways that uh, reflect uh, well on him or at least don't reflect as badly on him as they otherwise uh, might. Certainly, there there will be people who know uh, or who uh, think they know uh, what uh, really occurred here, you know, who, who believe that there was a, an ISIS-K uh, terrorist attack, uh, who believe that Putin and the Russian security services had their eye off the ball because of uh, the, the war in Ukraine. And uh, uh, certainly among uh, some elements of the Russian elite or, or others with access to outside information, it may discredit Putin. I, I think that that's likely. Uh, what impact uh, will that have on Putin's continued leadership? I, I'm not sure that it'll have too much. Well, it looks like he's still uh, pretty firmly in control. 
I guess the one uh, open question is, will there be further attacks? This was a very ambitious attack. If there were further attacks in coming weeks, that would unsettle Russia, wouldn't it? Oh, uh, I, I imagine that it would. I uh, I expect that the, the Russian domestic security agencies will be uh, at this point going into overdrive uh, to look for anyone uh, else in the country who they think uh, may be planning something like this. So, it, it, you know, it's always hard to know about the motives and the planning processes, you know, the terrorist organizations uh, use. There, there's a logic in trying to have multiple sequential attacks, but uh, uh, you know, as you execute each of them, you become uh, kind of increasingly vulnerable to the domestic security agencies. So, uh, if you had the capability to do that already, you know, there might also be a certain argument for doing multiple things at the same time uh, in in different locations, actually for uh, for for greater effect. Uh, but but who knows? Uh, certainly, if there are uh, more uh, attacks like this, particularly uh, attacks on this scale that that are so uh, destructive and horrific, and you know the official casualties, I, I believe at this point are 115. There are people on this uh, sort of Russian social media. Uh, channel Telegram uh, uh, talking about uh, 150. Uh, the the Russian authorities have essentially said that there was a big fire and part of the roof collapsed, and we're, we're not really going to know until we get into the building and and go through the rubble. It's a it, it, it's a terribly terribly uh, destructive uh, attack. Uh, and uh, pulling off uh, something else uh, on that scale uh, soon you know, may may prove to be challenging. Paul, one thing I wonder about is in the aspect of U.S.-Russian relations, which is that if Putin had not publicized this American warning, he could he could have dismissed it right right now. He could have said, well, we were never really warned or, you know, we didn't know. But he actually went out and denounced the warning. What, what yeah. effect does that have inside Russia itself? Yeah, I mean, th th this is the whole challenge. And of course, uh, there was a, a, you know, from what we know, a private warning first, and then, of course, a public statement on the U.S. Embassy website. Uh, so uh, if I, I think that Putin may have uh, felt a need uh, to, to say something uh, because of this announcement on the U.S. Embassy website, uh, the, the remarks that he made, uh, I believe, actually were remarks in uh, uh, an address that he was giving to security agency uh, officials in Moscow. So uh, it, it looked a little bit actually like uh, kind of a gratuitous uh, slap at the United States. Uh, but uh, yes, it, it put him on the record uh, kind of denouncing uh, this warning. Uh, that that was offered, and I think that's why uh, it, it you know took uh, uh, close to a day for him to get on Russian television. Uh, that's why we've had these uh, sort of contorted uh, explanations uh, emerging that well uh, maybe they were uh, Islamist uh, terrorists, but. Uh, uh, they were they were you know recruited online and offered money and who knows where that money came from and and by the way it looks like you know there was some coordination in their effort to escape Russia you know we're we're, we're seeing all of that uh, as an effort uh, to to try to deflect uh, responsibility from him uh, and uh, it, it's noteworthy that in his own remarks uh, so far. Uh, you know, he he made this uh, sort of reference to to coordination, you know, with their their effort to flee. Uh, but he didn't really provide a lot of other detail. You know, the Im investigation is ongoing. We've apprehended these people. And uh, I, I, that, that's also uh, kind of interesting. He's sort of leaving it, you know, to the Russian media. Uh, which, uh, uh, of course, is, uh, uh, you know, largely government controlled. 
He's leaving it to the Russian media to explain to, to Russian citizens uh, what occurred so that he, he kind of doesn't need uh, personally uh, to, to explain himself. To what degree, and that this this may be a question that, that no one in the West can really answer because Kremlin politics is pretty opaque, but to what degree do you think this revives some degree of unease in elite circles with Putin's rule? We saw that with the rebellion before with the Wagner Brigade about a year ago. Then things seem to die down. The war in Ukraine seems to be more successful. But now you have a real serious terror incident inside Moscow. Do you think that would revive at least some sense of unease among those elite circles? Well, I, I, of course, you know, the, the Russian elite isn't uh, monolithic. Uh, I think is is the first thing uh, that I would say there. You know, there are there are economic elites, uh, there are uh, security elites, there there are other uh, elements of the elite. Uh, certainly, I think the economic elites were uh, shocked by the decision to start the war in Ukraine in the first place. Uh, uh, within the security elites, uh, I think uh, you've seen certainly uh, when you look at at Wagner and Evgeny Prigozhin, uh, you know people who were uh, very frustrated with the conduct of the war. Uh, and, and thought that it wasn't uh, well executed. And a lot of that was re- reflected also by the sort of Russian military commentators on uh, Telegram. Uh, so uh, uh, there was uh, real frustration there. Uh, when the war uh, kind of wasn't going well, there was that there was a broader effort, you know, inside particularly the security elite, you know, to pin the blame on uh, one group or another. So you have a little bit uh, kind of military, you know, complaining that the intelligence services didn't give them good information in advance uh, of the war. And uh, uh, that's why the the beginning phases of the war went as poorly as they did. Uh, Then you have others, you know, kind of uh, uh, trying to pin the blame uh, on, on the military. Uh, I, I think the you know the key question in the final analysis is if you're in one of these elite groups and you're frustrated with Putin and his leadership, you know what what can you do about it? And uh, are, are there uh, like-minded people who you trust sufficiently, you know, that you can talk to uh, without yourself uh, being arrested, investigated, or or worse? Uh, if you somehow succeed in uh, having uh, impact on Russian policy, uh, is that going to uh, uh, sort of lead to a wholesale reevaluation of, of Western policy toward Russia uh, and removal of sanctions uh, and other things? Uh, or or uh, 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 is that not really a possibility? So I, I, I think there, there are a lot of uh, big, big questions there. Paul, I want to ask you a final question, which is, and, and spread the ambit a bit wider, which is that last night, Ukraine fired off more drone attacks against Russian oil refineries in the region of Samara, despite Biden administration warnings. Are we just entering what looks like a time of troubles for Russia and Ukraine, that we've just entered a new era of profound instability that is not going to go away? Look, I mean, if you look to uh, people like Karl von Clausewitz, you know, the sort of noted uh, German uh, uh, war theorist, uh, it, 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 he would say, you know, once you start a war, uh, there's a tendency to escalate and the side that's prepared uh, to escalate the most uh, is, is going to win. And uh, certainly in the case of Ukraine, uh, I think the Ukrainian leadership and and uh, many Ukrainian people feel that their country is in a war for its survival. Uh, and uh, when you're in a war for survival, then, uh, uh, you know, gasoline prices in uh, Ohio, for example, 
uh, you know, are uh, during an election year. You know, that that may be a really big concern for uh, the Biden administration. Uh, but uh, uh, the Ukrainian leadership and the Ukrainian military likely have uh, more immediate concerns. They're actually trying to increase gas prices in Russia, uh, by the way. Uh, and, and Russia had suspended at the beginning of March its own uh, gasoline exports for six months for precisely this reason. It is uh, an illusion uh, in many respects for U.S. leaders to believe that they can contain and manage uh, this conflict uh, because, uh, you know, certainly Russia is not uh, responding to our advice uh, and Ukraine obviously is dependent to a very large uh, extent or has been at any rate, but if there's no further forthcoming uh, American help uh, to Ukraine and, and that leverage over their uh, war fighting uh, sort of no longer uh, exists, uh, then I, I think we have uh, much less influence uh, on the tactics uh, that, that Ukraine uses. Uh, and uh, it, it does really risk uh, instability, uncertainty, escalation, horizontal escalation, vertical escalation. It, it, it's a very dangerous situation. I guess just to, to try and be slightly more precise, Russia has been fairly immune internally from this conflict until the past couple months with the, with the Ukrainians stepping up the drone attacks inside Russia. You couple that with what looks to be an extremely ambitious and well-executed terrorist, terrorist attack in Moscow. It just conveys the feeling, again, that the world is lurching away from the, what the stability we had during the Cold War toward a much more dangerous era. Oh, uh, I, I think the world is becoming uh, far more complex and dangerous. I'd certainly agree with you very much uh, on that point. And uh, uh, if the the attacks in uh, the the Moscow region uh, kind of demonstrate uh, anything, uh, it, it it certainly demonstrates that you know Russia has more than one problem uh, to worry about at the same time. And uh, Russia is not alone in that. You know, the United States is is kind of worried about Ukraine. We're worried about China and Taiwan. Uh, we're worried about Iran. We're worried about the Houthis and these attacks in the Red Sea. We're we're worried about Israel and Gaza and and so many other uh, issues. And uh, uh, again, there's uh, uh, I think on the part of some. Uh, an illusion uh, about the extent to which uh, we, we really have influence uh, o o over all of this and control and control and and shape it, and especially the extent to which uh, we can do uh, all of that uh, at the same time uh, with you know one government and one president and one secretary of defense and one chairman of the Joint Chiefs and one CIA. Uh, director and one uh, secretary of state a and uh, sorry, one national security advisor, if I didn't uh, uh, mention the national security advisor, you know, our, our, our government kind of only has so much capacity and uh, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the world is just a, uh, an increasingly complicated and, and dangerous place. Final, final question. <laughs> It just occurs to me that Vladimir Putin has created an enormous mess in Ukraine and he just got hit in Moscow. If he is unable to deal with these problems successfully, isn't it likely that a more ruthless leader will supplant him in the next couple of years? Uh, I, I don't think that we really uh, know the answer to that. I mean, uh, uh, there's uh, uh, success uh, kind of falls along a spectrum and uh, he, he doesn't need to be perfectly successful. Nobody will be. Uh, he only needs to be successful enough. 
Uh, and uh, a- a- at the same time, he, he needs to uh, kind of through a-, a combination of threats and-, and buying people off and setting them against one another and, you know, the various other tools that he has at his disposal to, to manage uh, the-, the Russian elite. Uh, he-, he needs uh, to keep anyone from feeling uh, sufficiently secure uh, that that they think they can move on him. Now, Prigozhin, uh, uh, of course, uh, was you know from a certain perspective unexpected, un, un, uh, unexpectedly successful with his uh, mutiny in the sense that uh, it, it went a lot further than than many thought something like that really could. But uh, you know, from another perspective, uh, if you're part of the Russian elite. You know, that failed and uh, he, he was killed uh, when his uh, jet exploded. Uh, th- th- this is uh, uh, one of those cases when uh, uh, I think there's a saying, you know, if, <laughs> if, if uh, th- that I'll paraphrase, you know, if, if you're going to go after the king, uh, you, you, you kind of have to kill the king. Uh, Putin, and- Putin, in other words, is more than ruthless enough already. Well, uh, you know, he's he's quite ruthless. Uh, I think he uh, certainly noted that uh, Gorbachev's uh, lack of ruthlessness got him into real trouble uh, as the Soviet Union uh, was unraveling. And uh, I, I think he's probably prepared to do a lot more than he has uh, so far to to keep things together uh, and to stay in power. Well, Paul, thank you for these acute observations on an early Saturday morning. We will no doubt return to these topics again. And thank you. And thank you to everyone for listening. Thank you, Jacob.